Hello campers and welcome to week four of the Met Opera Global Summer Camp. Can you believe it's week four? The halfway point. I can't believe it. We have got opera lovers from all seven continents joining us for this global summer camp. I'm Susan Blackwell, one of your camp counselors. I'm so happy to be here with you. This week's opera is Gounod's Romeo and Juliet. That's French for Romeo and Juliet. And you can watch that opera this Wednesday through Friday at the link provided in the Google Classroom beginning on Wednesday. And here is what's happening this week. Today, it's Get to Know the Opera with the phenomenal Dan Rubens, who actually has a master's degree in Shakespeare. Very smart. Tomorrow, that's Tuesday, we're going to be doing a fun hands-on activity with the brilliant actress Annalisa Leffler. Then on Wednesday, the Mets Executive Stage Director Paula Swazi will be hosting an artist chat with Isabel Leonard, a world-famous singer who plays Stefano in Romeo et Juliet and has also played lots of other trouser roles too. On Thursday, we've got opera story time with countertenor Anthony Roth Costanzo. Remember baking with him during the first week of camp? That was awesome. Oh, and I'll be in the career corner with Melissa Wagner, the executive director of the Met Opera National Council Auditions. Did you ever wonder how to become an opera star at the Met? Melissa knows. Send us your video questions. Also on Wednesday and Thursday, check-ins on Zoom with your camp counselors. And on Friday, it's Camper Showcase, hosted by your friends Dan Marshall and Camp Counselor Tim, where we get to see all the great things you've been making all week long. On Google Classroom, you can also find your creative challenge with Ms. Bryant, musical moments, and warm-ups with Ms. Berglund. And remember, almost all camp activities are live. Know that we want to hear from you, we want to know what questions you have, and we all want to learn from each other. And now, let's give a warm Met Summer Camp welcome to Camp Counselor Dan Rubens. Hi everyone, I'm Camp Counselor Dan, Camp Counselor Dan R. I'm so excited to be with you all today for the Met Opera Global Summer Camp. Uh, I've been watching all of the past weeks, so if you're a returning camper, I'm so excited to see what you create this week. You've done incredible work. You've asked incredible questions. And if you're new for the first time this week, welcome. I'm new too, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so Dan, if you could put up our keynote presentation, we're gonna be talking today about the wonderful opera, Romeo et Juliet which is a French opera based on Romeo and Juliet. So the first thing we're going to do is, if you haven't been to menti.com before, you're gonna go on another device or in another window, visit www.menti.com, and you're gonna put in the code 321295. And I'm gonna play a clip from the opera as you're putting in your responses. And what I want you to do is to choose from a number of options what you think is happening on stage. So Camp Counselor Dan, if you could put up the mentee, I'll start playing that clip once that's up. So do you think this music is a battle, a costume ball, a math class, a picnic, or a dentist appointment? <laughs> Amazing. So it looks like overwhelmingly we said a costume ball with a very jovial battle coming in second place. So what's really cool and what we're going to be talking about more today is that oftentimes in opera, just from hearing the music, yeah, exactly right, Kaylee, a costume ball. 
we can get a sense of what's happening on stage, what kind of emotions there are, what kind of environment we're in. So we're going to be talking today about how Gounod, the composer, in writing this opera, brings all of these events and these emotions to life with music. And even if we don't speak French, even if we don't know what the singers are saying on stage, although you will have subtitles in English when you watch, we can still figure that out just from the music. So if we can go back to the keynote, Dan, we're gonna start talking about Romeo and Juliet, which if you know anything about the play Romeo and Juliet, you know that this is very sad. It ends as a giveaway in the very beginning with some very sad ending for our main characters. But even though this is a very sad story, we can still have fun. We start out with a costume ball and we'll be making activities and projects all week that are gonna be really fun. We're gonna be having some fun visits from some phenomenal musicians and artists and actors. Uh, so even though this is a sad opera, a little bit like Rusalka last week, this can still be a really fun week for us. So we're gonna start off our journey in learning about this. This all starts with this guy. And you can put who this guy is in the chat if you know. He is, of course, the famous playwright, William Shakespeare, a very cool guy. And what you'll learn actually from camp counselor Annalisa tomorrow is that the story of Romeo and Juliet began way before Shakespeare and he was adapting. He was taking all different kinds of stories and putting them together in Romeo and Juliet. But the most famous Romeo and Juliet story, of course, is Shakespeare's play. So Shakespeare, who you've, I'm sure you've all heard of in some context, in some form, came up with all of these words and phrases in his plays. He's a, a major inventor of the English language, words like zany, expressions like what the dickens, and it's Greek to me, and knock knock who's there, all came from Shakespeare. And Shakespeare wrote 37 plays. Those include Hamlet, A Midsummer Night's Dream, King Lear, Twelfth Night, maybe plays that you've heard of, maybe plays you've gotten to perform in or see, but he also wrote Romeo and Juliet. You've seen his birthplace, Vivian, very cool. I have as well. It's in Stratford-upon-Avon in England. Very cool place. So this is a, a photo of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. And this is actually the theater uh, was built in the 1990s, but it was created to look and be a replica of the original Globe Theater that Shakespeare worked in, in London. And while this theater, the original Globe Theater was built from the same timbers, from the same wood that the theater where Romeo and Juliet first was performed uh, in. So Romeo and Juliet was performed in a theater in the early 1590s and the theater was called The Theater. It was a really creative title for a theater because it was the first theater like that in London. And they knocked it down and then rebuilt a new theater called the Globe Theater. So I got the experience of studying. I did a master's degree in Shakespeare studies at the Globe Theater in London. So here's me in the new fancy reconstructed globe. There's me. And there's the famous balcony that is used in Romeo and Juliet. And we're gonna learn more about this week. So I'm camp counselor Dan R. I'm a fourth grade teacher in Brooklyn at the Williamsburg Northside School. I think some of my students may actually be watching. So hi all if you are. And I, as I said, I have a master's in Shakespeare studies. So I love Shakespeare. So now we're gonna fast forward 270 years across the English Channel to France. And we're gonna meet our composer, Charles Gounod. So Charles Gounod decided he wanted to write an opera of Romeo and Juliet, but he knew he couldn't do it alone. He would need help. So he called upon the librettists. And librettists, as you've learned in past weeks, are the people who wrote the words for operas, who write the words for operas. So he had two librettists. One was Jules Barbier, and the other was Michel Carré. So I know you've really admired the mustaches of composers in past weeks. These guys are bringing some pretty solid mustache game. So throw into the chat if you want whose mustache you think is the coolest. I'm interested to know what you all think. I think Michel Carré's is pretty triangular and cool. So here is the story they told of Romeo 
et Juliette. So it all begins with a party at Lord Capulet's house, where you see some pretty cool costumes. That peacock costume is pretty awesome. And here's Lord Capulet. Yes, Carré. I agree, Sandra. Uh, so here's Lord Capulet. And in the production that you're going to be watching, he is played he's by a bass, which is a, the lowest vo vocal part, by Laurent Nori. And he's invited to this party a friend named Paris, who's really excited because this is a really fancy costume party. And he's played in this production by a baritone, which is a little higher voice than a bass, David Crawford. And Paris has been promised in marriage to Lord Capulet's daughter, Juliette, or Juliette in French. And here's Juliette, and she's played in this production by the soprano Diana Damro. And Juliet's not too excited about marrying Paris. You can see in her face, she's like, not really into this idea. And who should crash the party but a guy named Romeo, Romeo, who's played by the tenor, which is a higher voice part for a male voice, played by Vittorio Grigolo. I know I saw on the Google Classroom already, we have some big Diana Danro fans here. So it's really exciting that we're gonna get to hear a lot of her this week. And Romeo's rolled in with his friends Mercutio and Stefano. And Mercutio is played by the baritone Elliot Mador and mezzo-soprano Virginie Verez plays Stefano. So Stefano, which is a character that's not even in the play. So if, you're read, if you've read the play or you've seen the play and you're like, Shakespeare didn't have a Stefano, you're right. Uh, this was created by the librettists, a new character named Stefano, which is a trousers role, which means it would be sung by a woman, a mezzo-soprano, playing a boy, a young man. So before we move on, I'm gonna tell you about one really cool activity that you can do this week. On the Google Classroom, you'll see the text of a famous speech that Mercutio gives about the mystical fairy Queen Mab who visits dreams. So if you want to record your own version of this monologue, you can do that and share it with us on the Google Classroom. You can also, I saw someone was asking if they could write uh, their own music for this monologue and turn it into a song. You could totally do that too. And you'll hear when you watch the opera, how Gounod set this text, wrote this monologue into an aria, which is really cool. So we're gonna move along with our synopsis. So they say, it's safe to unmask now. And Romeo says, no, you promised we must be careful. So why is he saying we have to keep our masks on? It's not for the same reason that we keep our masks on in 2020. It's because of the feud. So in this story, which takes place in Verona in Italy, hundreds of years ago, there is a feud, a family feud between two families, a fight between two families that's been going on for years and years, and nobody really can remember why. But there are these two families, the Capulets and the Montagues. So we've already met a bunch of the Capulets. There's Lord Capulet, there's Juliet, his daughter, there's Paris. There's also Juliet's cousin Tybalt. And Tybalt is always trembling with rage. He's constantly angry. And he's played by another tenor, Diego Silva. We also have Juliet's nurse who takes care of her, kind of like a maid. And she is a mezzo-soprano named Diana Montague. And this is the most confusing name possible because Diana Montague is playing Gertrude, who is a Capulet. So Montague playing a Capulet, kind of confusing, but here's our chart. And then on the Montague side, we have Romeo and his friends Mercutio and Stefano. And this line in the middle reminds us that the Montagues and Capulets do not get along. But as soon as Romeo walks in, he meets eyes with Juliet and like a ray of light in the darkness, OMG, it is love at first sight. But unfortunately, Tybalt is watching from a balcony and he again, as usual, is trembling with rage. So Juliet sings, hatred is the cradle of this doomed love. When she finds out who Romeo is, she realizes they can't be together because of that feud. And Romeo is feeling the same way. My very name is a crime in her eyes. She hates me just because of my family. 
another reference to that feud. So now we move into act two. Just like Shakespeare's plays, this opera is in five whole acts. So a feud is a fight between two groups. So a feud is when there's a long ongoing battle between often two families or two groups of people who have different opinions or different identities. So in this case, it's the Capulet family and the Montague family who hate each other. So the great question. So in our next scene, we get this famous scene from the play where Romeo visits Juliet's house and stands below her balcony. And here's, there's even a line from the play in the opera, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. And Juliet shows up on her balcony and here's a photo, an actual photo from 1867 from the original productions of the opera when it went to London. It was performed in London at the opera there. And here's what it looked like in that first production. So you can see the balcony was a lot lower then. But Romeo in this production is constantly climbing on things. He loves to climb and then he loves to jump off things. So you'll see that a lot in this opera. So first he's climbing up this pillar and then he realizes he has to jump off. So he does that. Then he climbs up this other pillar. He's still thinking about how much he loves Juliet. Then he has to jump off that one. And what you'll learn tomorrow from Camp Counselor Annalisa is a lot more about what happens in this famous scene, what they, Romeo and Juliet sing to each other in this famous balcony scene. So now we move on to act three. And what, so the opera was written in the 1860s. So hundreds of years after the play. So one of the really cool things about this production of the opera, which is directed by Bartlett Schur, who is the person who decided what would happen on the stage, is they between the scenes, the sets change in front of you. So here's this guy, this wheelbarrow chair guy, who comes on with a wheelbarrow full of chairs to change the set from the balcony, outside the balcony, to the abbey, the church where Friar Lawrence works. So Friar Lawrence is a friend of Romeo's, but he's not on either side of the feud. He's trying to help keep the peace. And Romeo comes to him and says, Friar Lawrence, will you help me and Juliet to get married? We really want to get married. And Friar Lawrence is also a bass. He's the lowest voice in the opera, and he's played by Mikhail Petrenko. So R Friar Lawrence says, okay, I'll help you get married because I hope this will help resolve, move on from this terrible feud. Now, meanwhile, Stefano, who is Romeo's friend, and as he says, really just likes music, gets into a fight outside with the Capulets. Stefano's in the Montague side of the feud, and he runs into the Capulets, and they get into a fight. Now, he doesn't have a sword. He just has a baguette. Then Mercutio shows up with just a broom, but soon enough, Tybalt comes on stage with a sword. And he wants to fight Romeo because he saw Romeo with his cousin Juliet. And he doesn't like that. And Romeo comes on and he's like, no, 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 I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not going to tell you why, but now I, I care for you. You're like family. He doesn't want to say that he married Juliet, but he doesn't want to fight her cousin. But Mercutio is like, we got to fight. We have to stand up for ourselves. And then Mercutio gets stabbed by Tybalt and dies. So that's the first big tragedy, really first sad thing that happens in this opera. And then Romeo gets so mad that he kills Tybalt in revenge. So now we have two people dead already, Mercutio, Romeo's best friend, and Tybalt, Juliet's cousin. And the Duke, who's in charge of the city of Verona, comes on stage and banishes Romeo. He says, you need to leave our city tonight. So right now we're gonna take a very quick break to take a quiz. So go back to our Menti account and we're gonna take a quick quiz there to see what you remember from the summary so far before we go on. So Dan, if you want to go to our Menti page. So our next question is, which of these characters is on the Montague side of the feud? Is it Juliet? Is it Paris? Is it Friar Lawrence? Is it Stefano? Or is it the guy with the chair wheelbarrow? The wheelbarrow full of chairs. So I'll give you another few seconds to put in your answers. And yeah, 
Great work. So it is indeed Stefano, who is Romeo's friend, who just got started that fight with the baguette, right? Shout out to the people who said chair wheelbarrow guy. I love him too. Maybe he is a Montague at heart. You can Maybe you can create that for one of your activities this week. We can decide that together. So Dan, if we can go back to our keynote, you can keep adding to the mentee if you want. That'll be up. <gasps> it's joke o'clock. Let's see what we got. So for those of you who are new, this is something we do every week. This week, I'm hoping you'll submit some Shakespeare jokes. So Dan, let's, let's see this first joke. Alishka asks, why do eggs hate jokes? Hmm. The answer cracks them up. Very funny, Alishka. Very nice. And here's a question. What do you call dinosaurs with glasses? Hmm. I'm not sure. Let's find out. Tyrannosaurus specs. Very, very good. I like it. So if you have more jokes, you can submit them and we'll be able to share them throughout the week. I'm really excited to see what you come up with. So now we're back toward the end, getting to the end of our opera story. So the Capulet family is very sad that Tybalt, Juliet's cousin, has died. So Capulet's like, you're going to marry Paris right now, that friend who had come to the party, because he doesn't know that Juliet is secretly married to Romeo. Meanwhile, this guy's in the back. Nobody knows who he is. If you can figure it out, let me know. But Friar Lawrence has a plan. He says to Juliet, if you take this potion, it will look like you died, but you'll actually just be asleep, in a very deep sleep, and then Romeo can sneak into your tomb and you'll wake up and you'll escape together. So this seems like a really good plan at the time. And Juliet's like, okay, I'm in. And then she's about to get married to Paris and collapses. And as she's collapsing, she's like, this terrible feud, it's your fault, dad. And then Lord Capulet thinks that Juliet's dead. So this takes us to our final act where very sadly, nothing's good is going to happen here. We already find out in the first moments of the opera, a chorus comes on and tells us that Romeo and Juliet aren't going to make it out in good shape. They spoil the ending. So I'm not spoiling anything for you right now because it will be spoiled from the first minute of the opera. But we're going to go all the way to see how this takes place. Romeo shows up at the tomb, but unfortunately, he's missed the message that Juliet is really just asleep. He thinks that she is dead. So he drinks a poison. And just after he's drank the poison, Juliet wakes up and he hears her singing and says, how bewildering. And momentarily, he's so excited that he forgets he drank the poison and they're singing together how happy they're going to be. But then he remembers and tells her, I drank poison. So he's about to die and she doesn't want to live without him. So she reaches for the dagger in his boot. And so she decides not to live either. She, they both take their own lives. And that's the tragic, terrible end of this story. But you have the opportunity to see if there is a better ending that could have happened. So there's a choose your own adventure in the Google Classroom, an activity that lets you decide what moment in the story, what moment in the opera could someone have done something differently that might make the ending turn out differently? Maybe they would have decided, let's not get married right away. Let's, let's see what happens. Maybe they would have been able to escape together. So you can pick one moment in the opera where a character can make a different choice. You can do whatever you want to, to tell the story. You can make a graphic novel, a stop motion video, you can write a play or come up with your own idea and you'll tell the story. Yeah, it's a, it's a indeed, Kyrie, it's a very sad story. I've seen a, the play a bunch of times and it's always so upsetting because you feel like maybe something different will happen this time. So this time, maybe you can make a different ending come about. Maybe they can resolve the feud, bring about a happy ending to avoid this tragic fate for Romeo and Juliet. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Hold on. I just went to the end. But I'll, oops. No problem. Give me one second. 
I love seeing all those reactions you're having. Okay, Dan, you can post back up. Sorry about that. So here, you'll also see when you watch this production, uh, the wonderful conductor Maestro Noceda and the phenomenal orchestra of the Metropolitan Opera. If you ever get the chance to come to New York, you should definitely come check out the Met and hear the amazing orchestra there. So what I want to talk about for a little bit of the rest of our time, before we talk about some more activities, is what's with all the singing? They had a perfectly good play, right? Why did we decide to make it an opera? What does that add for us? And I'm really curious to see what all of you think and to share some of what I think. Because you've been watching some operas for the last few weeks, many of you. So what's the, why, why make operas? Why tell stories with music? So I wonder why they took this famous play and turned it into an opera. Maybe it's because, as Stefano says, we just like music because it's cool. But let's listen some more and think about it. So I'm going to play for you a piece of music from the opera. So if you go to Menti, you can type in this code again, and you're going to listen to this music of Juliet singing. And I want you to choose. So if we, Dan, we can switch to our Menti. You're going to see a bunch of emotions up there. You can choose more than one. And as it plays, you're going to choose which emotions you think you hear in Juliet's voice. So let's take a listen. <laughs> I've seen some really interesting reactions on here. So it seems like there's a range of ways that we're interpreting this music. So I see a lot of people saying they hear sadness in Juliet's voice and in the music, a lot of people saying excitement, and a lot of people saying joy. When I listen to it, I hear a combination of joy and excitement, I think. But it's really fascinating that a lot of you said sadness. And it shows that different music hits us in different ways. And if you're used to hearing certain music reminding you of one type of emotion, maybe a certain type of voice reminds you of sadness more than joy. We might respond in different ways. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about how Gounod decided to use the music to show the joy and excitement that he was trying to show. Maybe, oh, it's joke o'clock. Let's see what we have. What happens to cello player who eat too many beans before the opera performance? I don't know. Little worried about this one. Let's see. They are put in the wind section. Wow. Very, very good. Let's see our next one. What is a cat's favorite color? Hmm. I'm trying to, to think if I can come up with it. I don't know. Let's see. Purple. Very nice. I was trying to think what purr could be in, but... You got it, awesome. So if we go back to our, so let's go into a little bit more detail. So we're gonna go back to our mentee and as we're listening to this, another part of the same aria that Juliet's singing, you can type in a couple of words to describe or one word at a time to describe what the voice and the music sound like to you. So not just emotions, but just describe what you're hearing. Uh, you can describe her voice, you can describe the music, and let's see what we come up with, because I'm interested to see. I've been surprised by some of your reactions, so I'm really excited to see what you say about this last part of the aria. 
So I love that I'm seeing so many different words here. Oh, beautiful is very large. Happy is pretty big. But it's so fascinating to me that people are hearing sadness and happiness in her voice. Dan, can we make that a little bit bigger if possible so I can see what people are saying? Thank you. So, and high is pretty, it's pretty high, right? And one of the words that I saw in there was coloratura. So good work, because we're going to talk about what that means in a couple minutes. But I... I, you can see excited, lovely, excitement. I saw wanting somewhere in there, anticipation. I love these ideas, overexcited, yeah. So we're gonna talk a bit about how Gounod makes you feel these things, that you can just hear her voice and know that she's overexcited, that she's anticipating, that she's, let's see, what else do we have here? That he's using these things like high pitched and high and coloratura, which we'll talk about, to tell you these emotions. So actually in this aria, Juliet in the first scene is saying she doesn't want to get married to Paris. She wants to stay a kid. And what Gounod is able to do is in this music, make her sound young, make her sound excited and make her sort of bubble up with all of this emotion in a way that maybe words alone couldn't do. She could have a nice speech in a play, right? She could say really beautiful words, but music and the singing voice can do all of these crazy high notes that you can't really do when you're just speaking. So even if you don't speak the same language as Juliet, which a lot of us probably don't listening to it, we can still understand those emotions. So if we can go back to our keynote, I love all of these amazing ideas you put in. This is gonna be a phenomenal week. So if we go back here, we can talk about some of the tricks that composers use to fill their music with emotions. So one of them, as you wrote, high notes can show us, in this case, I think it's showing us how excited she is, how, what you said, what, how much anticipation she has of joy, of being young, how fun it is to be a young person. Because she's just a teenager in the story and Romeo is as well. And fast notes, you heard those fast runs up and down. And we're gonna talk about what those are called in a minute. And those show her excitement. She can't wait to express herself, to show her joy. So some new words for some of you, or old words, thank you for teaching us that. Coloratura is when you're singing, a coloratura soprano is someone who can sing those fast runs of notes, jump really high, add what's called ornamentation, add lots of little details, an extra short note there. So while you listen to the opera, when you watch it, listen for that coloratura, all those runs that go up and down. So it's again, it's called coloratura. And it's like coloring in all of these different emotions as Juliet sings these incredibly difficult pieces of music. Exactly, coloratura is high and lots of leaps and trills. Yeah, so trills are where you go back and forth on one note. And Diana Damrau, as you heard, is amazing at singing in that way. There's also something called grace notes, which are little notes that come ahead of the longer note or ahead of the beat of the music. So in her aria, which is a waltz, which means it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three what you'll hear is that she's singing, but um, but um, but um. And it's almost as if with those little grace notes, before the long notes, she's so excited she can't even wait for her time to come in. 
she has to express herself early because what you said, she's anticipating it. She's overexcited. She can't even follow the music. She's just going all over the place. And I think we can really hear that in the music. And that's something that you can express probably in any other form except opera. So what we're gonna do now, after looking at this wonderful confetti cannon photo, is we're going to look up another, up oh, an activity alert. So inspired by this piece of music, there's an activity called It's Cool to Be a Kid r &J Edition. So how would you feel how do you express what it feels like to be a kid, like Juliet does in this aria without using words? How do you express maybe the excitement of being a kid? Maybe you feel another way about being a kid. So you can compose a piece of music, you can create a work of art, you can choreograph a dance or come up with your own idea, right? Uh, you can make a graphic novel uh, or a stop motion animation. I know people are really into that. But see if you can find some way, like Gounod did with this aria, to show your excitement about being a kid, to show that overexcitement, that anticipation, and turn it into your own work of art. So what we're going to do now is we're going to listen to one more scene before we go through all of our activities for the week. And this is a very different scene, but I think you'll hear some really cool things in the music. So if you type in your Menti code one last time. As you listen to this piece of music, you're gonna type in, you can type a word or a phrase about what emotions you're hearing in this piece of music. And if you have any guesses about what's happening in the story. So I'm gonna start playing the music and you can flip over to the Menti whenever you like. So you're just typing in what, you're, what emotions you're hearing what you think might be happening in the story. Amazing responses I'm seeing. If we can scroll down a little bit. So I see a lot of battle, swords, fighting and war. The music is very fight-like, a dramatic scene, suspenseful. A big battle or a rock concert, I like it. Death and more disturbing things, a little violent. It's chaos, mm. fighting, Rah! fighting with forks and spoons and knives. I think they might be swords. The, some devastating event. And I saw someone say the fight between Romeo and Tybalt. Battle swords banging, the two men that dieth. Very nice, it sounds angrier. So all that is exactly right. So in this music, this is happening in the battle between Mercutio, Romeo's friend, and Tybalt, Juliet's cousin. And what you heard in the music was this huge chorus of people singing while they were fighting. Now in the play, if there's a lot of people on stage, they don't break out into song, right? They might be like screaming or going like, ah, but, or they might be fighting too, but they're not singing. So what's so cool about the opera and what's so cool about turning a play or a story into an opera is that it's cool. It's okay to make the drama huge by adding in a whole chorus of people singing their emotions, singing that anger, singing that battle and fight emotions into the scene that we're in. So without even knowing what was happening on stage, you all could hear it in the music. And that's what I think is so cool about opera. So while you're watching the opera, thank you, Cooper. Uh, while you're watching the opera, I hope that you'll listen for more of those moments where you can imagine what's happening on stage, even if you have your eyes closed, even if you're not reading the subtitles, which you definitely should. But if you close your eyes for a minute, maybe you can still understand the emotion. And there's a beautiful range of emotions, powerful emotions, joy, despair, 
anger in this opera. So can we go back to our keynote and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other activity options for this week. So you might have seen in that last slide, we have a, an insult being landed on Tybalt from Mercutio. Mercutio is saying, you rat catcher, which comes right from the play. So Shakespeare was a really great expert, not only at creating new words, telling beautiful stories, writing powerful reactions to the world he was living in, but also at insulting people. So he came up with some amazing insults in his plays. And when you go on to Google Classroom, you'll find a list of Shakespearean insults that you can mix and match. They're in three columns, A, B, and C. You can mix and match an insult to Shakespearean insult together. And then you can record a video of yourself saying thou three insults in a row and thou means you. So you can create your own insult. If you click onto the Flipgrid link, which is a video program for uh, recording some of these projects that you can use if you want, you can also record a video on your phone or on your computer on any device you want. If you use Flipgrid, you'll already see there are some amazing insults that some of you have already shared, which are pretty funny. Another activity alert that some people have already completed this weekend, which is crazy and awesome, is the Romeo and Juliet vlog or a video blog. So imagine that you're a character in the opera. It could be Romeo, it could be Juliet, it could be the guy with the wheelbarrow full of chairs. So you can record a video of yourself talking about everything that's been going on in this crazy city of Verona. You could play a bunch of characters, you could pick any moment in the opera. Nice. Uh, you could pick any moment in the opera and you could tell the story. If you want, you can just write it as a blog and submit it that way. Um, and you can give your perspective on what's happening. Someone already recorded an amazing vlog from the perspectives of a mother and a daughter who came to the costume ball at the beginning, which is pretty, pretty creative. Someone wrote a blog post from the perspective of Romeo. So there's all these different options for you. So that's one activity. Another activity is called instrumental inspiration. So just like we did at the very beginning of this video, where we listen to the costume ball music, just the orchestra playing, if you go on the Google Classroom and click on instrumental inspiration, you can hear three different pieces of music from the opera that have no words in them. They're just Gounod's music. And while you listen, you can create some art of your own in response to that. This is something I love to do with my students in the classroom with all different types of music. So while you're listening, you can take out a piece of paper or type and write down a poem. Or you can get some art supplies and draw or paint. Or you can improvise a dance to the music you're listening to. And if you want to keep going, some of these pieces are short, like just a few minutes. So you can play the music over and over. So see if you can respond to this one piece of music and create another work of art inspired by it. So it could be like you're describing what you think is happening on stage if you want, or it could just be whatever this music makes you think of. Maybe it makes you think of a field, even if there's no field in the opera. So this is a great question that just came up. Do you have to do all the activities? Absolutely not. You can do as many of the activities as you want, you can do none of the activities if you just want to come on and watch some of these amazing talks with artists this week and just see what other people are doing. That's fine. You can do all the activities if you want. You can create your own activity if you want. Whatever you, whatever way you want to participate, that's amazing and works for us. So here's another activity that I think you're going to like. When you watch the opera, which will become available on Wednesday, you can follow along with a scavenger hunt of nine moments from this production of the opera that you'll be watching. And they're all moments that we talked about. So you can download this from the Google Classroom and you'll see it includes Romeo jumping off a wall, Romeo jumping off a pillar, the wheelbarrow chair guy, Tybalt spying on Romeo and Juliet, Stefano fighting with the baguette. So all of these moments are available for you to find in the production. So if you watch with your scavenger hunt, sheet, you can see how many of them you actually can spot, how many of these moments stand out to you while you're watching. So I'm excited to see how many of them you each can find. So just to recap, we have all of these different 
activities. We have our scavenger hunt. We have our Shakespearean insults. We have It's Cool to Be a Kid, where you're imagining how in your own art form without words can you express what it's like to be a kid, whether that's bubbling over with anticipation or whether that's some other emotion, some other way you feel about being young. Or choose your own adventure where you're imagining what choice could someone make that might make this story of Romeo and Juliet turn out differently. And we also have the RNJ vlog. What could uh, someone be imagining throughout the opera at some point in the opera? Uh, what is someone's experience that you could share through a video blog or just typing your own blog? And finally, we have Be a Shakespeare Star, where you're recording your own interpretation of Mercutio's famous speech. If there's another speech in Romeo and Juliet that you are really excited about sharing with us, you can do that too. So anything else that you can imagine, I know there are some bakers who have been posting amazing baked goods inspired by the operas on here. So if you wanna bake a Romeo and Juliet themed cake, A, I would love to eat it, but B, I would love to see what it looks like. So here is our schedule for the rest of the week. Dan, if you wanna join me to talk through it um, for our- I would love to, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> so for our younger campers, or for all campers, you'll be back on tomorrow with camp counselor Annalisa, who's an amazing Shakespearean actress. Uh, I've had so much fun talking to her about this opera, and I think you will too. She's wonderful, isn't she? She's fantastic. And then on Wednesday, I'll be on, camp counselor Annalisa will be on to check in with you, the younger cohort, at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, to check in on any questions you might have, anything you want to talk about about the activities you're doing or the opera, and that will be on Zoom. Uh, do you want to continue on? Sure, sure. And then on Wednesday, July 8th at noon, um, we will have uh, Camp Counselor Paula here, and she will be uh, having a Q&A with mezzo-soprano Isabel Leonard, who has played Stefano in this production. And Isabel Leonard is one of the greatest stars of the Metropolitan Opera stage. And um, she's a New York City uh, hometown gal. And we're so excited to have her uh, talking with Paula. And she'll answer your questions, which you can submit. Um, we love the video questions. It's very fun. You can find the job form to submit a video question in the Google Classroom. So make sure you do that and, and make sure you tell us where you're from and, and state your question very clearly. You guys come up with the most brilliant questions I could never even consider. So that's Wednesday at noon. And then uh, Thursday, the older cohort will have their check-in on Zoom. Now remember the Zoom links are found in the Google Classroom. And uh, if you need the Google Classroom codes, you can always just email us at summercamp at medopera.org. Uh, most of you should have them by now. They come out weekly in your Friday email. And let's see, then Thursday is always an action-packed day here at Med Opera Summer Camp. Wow. Thursday at noon, we are going to have Opera Story Time with, back by popular demand, countertenor Anthony Roth Costanzo. You remember Anthony, in week one, he baked with us for Hansel and Gretel. He sang, he baked, you all made those delicious cookies. Well, this time he's coming back, he's going to read a storybook and just answer some of your questions. So we're very excited to have Anthony with us uh, on Thursday at noon. And then uh, on Thursday at one, camp counselor Susan Blackwell, will be in the career corner with the executive director of the Mets National Council Auditions, Melissa Wagner. Now, Melissa is super cool. She is um, a singer who turned uh, her career and took a U-turn and started um, producing these uh, auditions all over the United States that culminate in a competition on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera and she's been responsible for discovering, or these auditions have been responsible for discovering some of the greatest stars to ever grace the Metropolitan Opera stage. So if you have questions about your audition process or how you make it to the Met stage, or maybe what you should be singing for your college audition, your university audition, 
send us a question, send us a video question for Melissa. She would love to hear from you. She is the coolest. You're gonna have such a great time with Susan and Melissa. And then of course on Friday, Dan, it's our campus showcase. You'll be there, I'll pop in and out. Camp counselor Tim will be there, Annalisa will be there. We're gonna have a great time celebrating all of your amazing yeah. work. So- I cannot wait to see what you all create. We are gonna have a great, great week together. So thanks for inviting me in to share the lineup with everybody. Do we have any questions that have come in that we- Let me just check, take a quick check here. Uh, well, obviously those cookies were delicious, Bonnie. We agree. The Anthony Roth Costanzo. Yes, Anthony was a winner of the Met National Council auditions. Dr. Kamala just posted that. So was Renee Fleming, someone said. Yeah, um, I've gone to watch those final, the final round of the Met National Opera Council auditions almost every year. And it's so cool to see. There's a great documentary about it that you can watch. And most of the people in that documentary are now huge opera stars. So absolutely. Careers take yeah. off is really awesome. Um, I don't see a ton of other questions here. Thanks, Danny. Another Dan. We're just rounding yeah. out all the Dan. All we are Dan. gonna have a super fun week, Lydia. We yeah. wanna thank all of you for being here. Yes. Michaela, correct. Oh, that's my, hi, Mickey. That's one of my students from this year. So, oh, cool. Thanks to have you watching. Um, so yeah, I'll be in the Google Classroom all week. If you have questions, if you're getting started on activities, or if you want to share what you're doing, I'm excited to respond to you all. And I've already been in touch with some of you on there. And it's so excited to see what you come up with. Yes, it it's always very, very fun. Um, and I love the question earlier about how much of these activities do we have to participate in? Remember, this is up to you. It's your summer. We like to say it's summer camp, not summer school. So if it isn't fun, just take a break. But it's all really fun. And we're so lucky to have Camp Counselor Dan Rubens here. He is one of the smartest and most talented teachers that I've ever had the good pleasure to meet. And here we are today. So um, we are going to bounce everybody. We've got um, the older cohort is going to start their uh, getting to know Romeo and Juliet lesson in a few moments. So maybe some of you will come back. Yes, Dan and Dan, we should go on the road, right? Arthur, <laughs> there we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, friends, thank you, thank you so much. We will, as Lydia says, talk to you later. Okay, everybody? Bye. All right, bye-bye. See you soon.